This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace and peace and welcome to Worship with St. John's. Uh, even though we are not meeting in person, there are still things going on in the life of the church that we want to share with you. So please do not fast forward through me right now. It's a little bit unnerving to me that you have the ability to do that now. Uh, but there are some important announcements that we want to share with you. The Youth Fellowship, Fellowship will be meeting uh, today at 4 o'clock via Zoom. Uh, there's a link in the weekly youth email that Ridgely sent out. Uh, Ridgely is also sending out a video story time each week. So she's going to be reading a storybook for some of our younger kids. Be on the lookout for that in her weekly emails. Nancy Arico has organized a prayer service by phone a couple of times each week. She did it this past week. It worked really well, and so she'll be doing it again this week. Monday at 3 o'clock, Tuesday at 11 a.m., and Thursday at 7 p.m. This will all be going out to you in an email update, so you will have the days and the times and the numbers to call. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday as we begin Holy Week. Unfortunately, we will not be back worshiping together in person. Uh, the stay-at-home order uh, will still be in effect, and we will probably not be meeting on Maundy Thursday or Easter Sunday either. Uh, that is a hard thing to have to share with you, but that is our reality right now. That's what we need to do to keep everybody safe. And so we're going to do the best that we can to work with that. We will still worship, just not in person. So we'll be sharing some more details with you about that in the coming days. Now, normally on Palm Sunday, the kids would be processing in, waving their palms as we sing. But since we won't be in the sanctuary next Sunday, the Christian Education Committee would like for you all to make your own palms at home. You can draw a palm on a piece of paper and color it, just make sure it's big enough to see. Uh, you can trace your hand on a piece of paper, color it green, cut it out, and use that as your palm. This is not just for kids, this is for anybody who wants to make a palm. What we're asking you to do is to make one, uh, to record a video of yourself waving it, and to send that to Ridgely. Uh, via email or phone, and information on that, the details, her address and phone number will be going out to you uh, in the update as well. Next Sunday is also Communion Sunday, and we are still going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, so when you sit down to watch the worship video next week, make sure that you have bread, uh, you have grape juice or wine if you want to go that route. If you don't have either of those and you don't want to go out to the store to get something, it is absolutely fine for you to use water. Jesus Christ is the living water, so we will make that work next week. So please, join us next Sunday uh, as we share the Lord's Supper together. We will let you know as more information and future plans become available. But for now, I want to invite you just to take a moment to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Iris is going to be playing our introit, Lamb of God. And normally we would have a, a poem or a verse on the cover of the bulletin, but that's gonna come up on your screen so you can read along with that as Iris is playing. But let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
And please join me now in our call to worship uh, as we read Psalm 130 together. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Let us pray. Most gracious God, You promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there with us. As we gather for worship this morning, maybe we're in groups of two or three, maybe we are by ourselves. But we are together in spirit, bound to one another and to you as members of the body of Christ. And so we call upon your holy presence that we would know that you are near and give ourselves in thanksgiving and praise to you. Open our eyes to your presence, here and everywhere, in this time and always. Remind us that you are with us every step of the way as we journey ever closer to the cross and the tomb and the resurrection of Christ. We give this time to you. We give ourselves to you. In his most holy name, amen. And let us now join together in singing our first hymn, Be Still My Soul. As Iris plays, you should be able to hear Jeff Estabrook singing along, providing us with a little guidance as we go. So let us rise either in body or in spirit as you feel called to do, and let us worship God. Still my soul, the waves and winds. 
Our call to worship recalls Psalm 130 and God's faithful love, even in the midst of our wilderness. And so trusting in God's faithful love, let us confess our sins to God. This morning, our prayer of confession will be a call and response. So there will be times for silent confession, and I will conclude those times with the call, Lord, in your mercy. And I invite you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you call us to focus on what is good and true, and we get distracted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We wait for you. Our whole being waits. But what we wait for is misguided. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We cry out to you for you to hear our prayers and answer them when and how we want. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We confess that we have been impatient, short with our loved ones, consumed by our stress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You invite us to come to you and we shoulder alone all that life brings us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us, O oh God. Forgive us for thinking that we know what is right. Forgive us for seeking to control anything and everything. Let our ears be attentive to you working in the midst of our wilderness. In the midst of many winding paths, direct us once again to you. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. This, this is the truth that we hold on to in the wilderness of Lent. That even in the midst of our darkness, God is faithful still. Friends, this is a reminder that there is nothing that separates us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Know this and be at peace this day and forevermore we are forgiven of our sins. Thanks be to God. For our children's sermon this morning, we will be working yet again from our book that is our Lenten devotional called Make Room, A Child's Guide to Lent and Easter. Last week, we talked about Jesus's time in the desert and our need in Lent to make space by caring for others. So if you have this at home, I invite you to turn to page 16 as we continue to talk about what it looks like to make space during Lent. 
One day, when his friends wanted to learn to talk with God, Jesus taught them to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When we pray for the kingdom of God to come, we are telling God what we hope for. We hope that people everywhere will listen for God, live the way God wants, and make space for what really matters. Imagine. During Lent, we make space. We clean our whole house, we sort our clothes and toys and books, and give away what we do not use. It is hard at first. I like my things, and I want to keep all of them. But someone else might need them more than I do. Besides, I like having space in my room. It makes me feel lighter. During Lent, we think about the kingdom of God. We plant seeds and wait for them to sprout. We mix yeast into water and flour and watch the dough rise. When the dough has risen, we roll and twist it to make pretzels. They look like little arms crossed in prayer. At supper, we cross our arms this way and pray that the kingdom of God will come. I wonder how this will happen. Maybe the kingdom of God starts very small but grows bigger and bigger so slowly we hardly notice. Maybe the kingdom of God happens right around us. Maybe it's happening now. So during Lent, we make our lives more simple. We eat plain meals, sometimes just bread and soup. Everyone helps with the cooking. We even give up buying some of our favorite treats and snacks. Instead, we put the money in a jar and save it. And when Lent is over, we will buy groceries for the food bank. Making do with less means that someone else can have enough. That seems fair. I like to have nice things. I like to buy treats. And I like to eat my favorite foods. But not all the time. There are times for filling up and times for emptying out. Lent is a time for emptying, for sharing, for giving away. It is good to make space. I invite everyone at home to join me in prayer as we do so from afar. I will say a portion of the prayer and I invite you to respond uh, by repeating it. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear God, We like to have nice things. We like to buy treats. And we like to eat our favorite foods. But not all the time. Thank you for the reminder that Lent is a time for emptying. Thank you for reminding us to share. Thank you for reminding us that it is good to make space. Amen. Next week, we will be talking about making room and the many ways that Jesus made room in the way he did his ministry. Over the past couple of weeks that we've been dealing with this virus, um, all of the messages that Ridgely and I have shared with you have been some version of things are really hard right now. It's scary and unsettling and lonely. We need to trust God to guide us through this. They've all kind of been focused on the negative, on what's wrong. And that's okay. That's what was needed in these first few weeks, coming to grips with this unsettling uh, reality of this new landscape that we have found ourselves in. 
but I don't want to stay there anymore. When I was looking at the lectionary, the calendar of assigned scripture readings for this week, the Old Testament reading was Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones. So it's the prophet Ezekiel, and he's standing with God in this valley that is just full of bones from countless dead bodies. The New Testament reading was Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And while both of these stories end with resurrection and new life, I didn't want to spend one more week with images of death. We all know this is hard. We all know it stinks. What else is there? And the thing that came to mind for me was this passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now, there are three sections here that we're going to look at. The first is verses 4 through 7, where Paul says this. He writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything, and God will give you peace. Easy to say much harder to do, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but over the past couple of weeks, I have worried a lot and have not felt like rejoicing very much. So while Paul talks a mean game here, what does he know about the situation that we are facing? Well, there are two things that are important to know that help us understand this section a little bit better. Paul starts off this chapter by saying, I urge Euodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. There are some translations that say, I urge them to live in harmony in the Lord. So there are two people in the church in Philippi, Euodia and Syntyche, women who are leaders of the church, and they are not of the same mind. They're not living in harmony Paul has to urge them to do so. The church in Philippi is having problems. There is division. The church is not whole. And yet it is immediately after saying that, that Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always, even when there are problems and things are not whole. The other important thing to know uh, about this section is that Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians while under house arrest. So the Romans have arrested him for his faith. Uh, he cannot leave the house where he is staying. He cannot leave the house where he is staying. Paul is quarantined. He is living in isolation. He is practicing social distancing. A quick aside on that. We need to change our language around that. We hear a lot of talk right now about social distancing, but that is not what we're doing. We are physically distancing ourselves from each other. That is important and necessary, but we are not, we cannot socially distance ourselves from one another. As a church, we have been finding ways to connect with each other across our isolation and physical distancing because that is what we all need right now, to know that we are socially connected despite our physical distance. So Paul is writing this letter while under house arrest, separated from the people he cares about while he is awaiting trial and eventual execution. And he is still able to say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything and God will give you peace. Peace is possible even in the midst of distance and death 
when things are not whole. So that's the first part that we're looking at today. I want to skip the second part right now and look at the third section next. Now, the third section is verses 10 through 14, where Paul writes this. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. So Paul is writing to the Philippians because they apparently reached out to him. Biblical scholars think that the church in Philippi collected some kind of offering for him and brought it to him, things that he needed while he was under house arrest. So he's thanking them for it. But what he's saying here is that this awful situation he has found himself in has become an opportunity for the Philippians to show him their love. He says, I I didn't actually need anything because I'm good with having plenty or having little. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but it was kind of you to share in my distress. We've been making phone calls all week. Me, Ridgely, the elders and deacons and some other leaders in the church. And whenever we reach out to someone and ask them if there's anything that they need, almost everyone has said, no, I have everything I need, but it was so kind of you to call and ask. Most of us have what we physically need right now. And if you don't, please call or email me or Ridgely and let us know. But what we are appreciative for is the phone calls and the emails and the love and care that we have all been able to show each other in the midst of this. This awful situation has become an opportunity for us to show our love and share in the distress of others. And that actually leads me back to the second section, verses 8 through 9, where Paul writes, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Every night when we put our kids to bed, uh, we say prayers together, and then we ask each of them, what are you grateful for today? We've been doing this for a while, Uh, and sometimes it's really easy for them. You know, I'm grateful that we got to have a yummy dinner tonight, or I'm grateful that I got to play with my friends. Uh, Sometimes it's hard for them. You know, sometimes they get so focused on a bad thing that happened to them during the day that they can't see anything else. There have been times when I asked what they were grateful for, and one of them said, well, pretty much nothing today. And I asked why, And they told me about these bad things that happened. And I listened to it and say, yeah, that's hard. But even with all those bad things happening, there must have been at least one good thing that happened today, even if it's really tiny. And they think and say, well, I got to go outside and play. And I say, yes. You know, let's celebrate that and give thanks to God for that. We want them to end each day, no matter how tough it was, focusing on the good things and the blessings that are in their lives. And that's what Paul is telling us here. 
Focus on the good things and the blessings that are in your life. This is not some kind of Pollyannish mindset where we live in denial and just ignore any of the problems and say, everything's great right now. Paul knows that everything is not great. The Philippians know that everything is not great. We know that everything is not great. But this is saying, in the midst of this, when everything's not great, where are God's blessings? What can I focus my heart and mind on so that I am not overwhelmed with all that other stuff? What can I give thanks for? And that's the question that I want all of us to keep asking throughout all of this. Where are the blessings? What can I give thanks for? When I look back over these past two weeks, I cannot tell you the last time I spent this much concentrated time with my family. I'm more involved in my kids' schooling than I have ever been. We start off each morning with a time of worship together where we sing a song, we read a Bible story, we pray together. We've never done that before. We go for walks or bike rides together every afternoon. And when we go around the neighborhood, there are families out in the yard playing. We we say hi to each other and stop to talk with enough distance in between us. We have met so many new neighbors. There are chalk drawings at the end of driveways all over our neighborhood. So the kids, the families, they've gone out and they've drawn these bright, colorful pictures in chalk on their driveways that say things like, you are not alone. We can do this. We are with you. As a church, We're finding ways to connect through technology so that we can keep meeting and praying and worshiping together. I hope it's helping us to see that the church is not a building, it is the people. And we're reconnecting with each other through phone calls. There is this renewed sense of community among us in which people are looking out for each other, taking care of each other. I look at the world around us. I saw a story the other day about how the water in the canals in Venice, uh, they're clear for the first time that anyone can remember because there are no boats traveling in them. People can see to the bottom. They can see fish swimming around in them. In Italy, dolphins have started coming closer to the coast than they ever have before. Japan has deer just roaming around in the streets. And in Thailand, there are monkeys all over the streets because there's no people to run them off. China has had record-breaking cuts in pollution, and people have talked about seeing the stars at night for the first time in years. The earth is healing itself. Good things can come out of this. There are blessings in the midst of this horrible situation. It's like the the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Uh, Joseph's brothers hated him. And so one day they attack him, uh, they sell him off as a slave in Egypt, but he ends up rising in power and becomes second in command to Pharaoh and ends up saving his brother's lives when a famine comes upon the land. And at the end of that story, he's reunited with his brothers and he says to them, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. Even though you intended to do harm, God intended it for good. Even though this virus intends to do harm, God is intending it for good. 
It's like Paul says to the Romans, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And it's not that God caused those bad things or this one, but that God can take the bad things that happen, the pain and suffering and brokenness of life, and use it to advance God's purposes in the world and in our lives. After all, this is the season of Lent, when we remember how God took the worst possible situation, the betrayal and crucifixion and suffering and death of Christ, and used it to bring about salvation and resurrection and new life. Where will we experience resurrection and new life in this? I came across a poem this week by an author named Donna Ashworth, and she writes this. History will remember when the world stopped and the flights stayed on the ground and the cars parked in the street, and the trains didn't run. History will remember when the schools closed and the children stayed indoors and the medical staff walked towards the fire and they didn't run. History will remember when the people sang on their balconies in isolation, but so very much together in courage and song. History will remember when the people fought for their old and their weak, protected the vulnerable by doing nothing at all. History will remember when the virus left and the houses opened and the people came out and hugged and kissed and started again, kinder than before. When this virus leaves, and it will leave, what kind of people will we be? Will we go back to our lives, our screens, shut the doors, shut each other out? Or will we keep calling and walking and riding our bikes and playing in the yard and riding on our driveways and talking to our neighbors and worshiping and praying and teaching our children? Will we let this make us the kind of people that we always wanted to be before. There are blessings in this, as hard as it is. Keep looking for them and focusing on them, on the things that are true and honorable and just and pure and pleasing and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise. Keep thinking about these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Let us now join together in affirming our faith uh, using these words from Romans chapter 8. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. 
Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us now join together in singing Lift High the Cross. Our children's Lenten devotional has been very prophetic for me this year in ways that I really hadn't imagined until we entered into all of this. <laughs> it's interesting that we find ourselves here in the season of Lent, being called to think about other people, caring for our neighbors, our healthcare workers taking time to pray for others and to cultivate community in new ways, reminding ourselves what enough looks like in the midst of scarcity. So out of our abundance gift, abundant gifts, this is a time for ourselves to remember the promises of God and then to respond by offering our prayers, our intentions, and our monetary gifts. So let us bring before God our gifts.
Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we are grateful for each and every gift you give us. The gift of a new day, a chance to start over. The gift of a phone call from a friend. The gift of sunshine and singing birds. The gift of our church family. We are grateful for the gifts of safety the ability to freely worship you, for the assurance of your steadfast love for us, for our abundant blessings, food on our tables, a roof over our head, blankets to warm us on a cold day. God, we pray that you would accept these gifts we humbly place before you, our very own lives, our monetary gifts, our intentions to live in a new way. God, we pray for our families as they navigate online school. We pray for those who are lonely. We pray for those with unanswered questions. We pray for those who are essential at this time and continuing to work especially our leaders as they work together and make hard decisions, our healthcare professionals on the front line caring for our country, and for their families who are at home supporting them. God, we pray this day for those who are battling cancer, Cindy, Debbie, Laurie, Henrietta, We pray this day for those who struggle with addiction and maintaining mental health. For Stephen and David, those at the Tuesday night meeting, and for all of us in this stressful time. We pray for healing for those in our lives that need it most. God, we pray for Larry, Melissa, John and Barbara, Marie, Annie, Maury and Jenny, Raj and Laura. We pray these many prayers in the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I came across a prayer this week by St. Therese of Lisieux, a 19th century French nun uh, that I'd like to close with. May today there be peace within. May you trust that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith in yourself and others. May you use the gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content with yourself just the way you are. Let this knowledge settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing, dance, praise, and love. It is there for each and every one of us. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen.
Go in grace and peace to serve the Lord.